This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, a brief history. I'm historian Christine Morgan, and welcome to Tudor's Dynasty, A Brief History. On this episode, we look at the early 20th century book by Sir Walter Besant called London in the Time of Tudors, and we'll share with you the stories of the Tudors. On stepping out of the 15th into the 16th century, one becomes conscious of change. No such change was felt in passing from the 12th to the 13th century or from the 14th to the 15th. The world of Henry VI was the same world as that of Edward I. It was also the same as that of Henry II. For 400 years, no sudden, perceptible, or radical change took place, either in manners and customs, language, arts, or ideas. There had, of course, been outbreaks. There had been passionate longings for change. Men before their time, like Wycliffe, had advanced new ideas which sprang up like grass and presently withered away. There had been changes in religious thought. But there was no change so far in religious institutions. At the beginning of the 16th century, however, we know the coming events. We can see the change impending, and the change already begun. Whether the bishops and clergy, the monks and friars, were also conscious of impending change, I know not. It seems as if they must have been uneasy, as in France, men were uneasy long before the Revolution. On the other hand, Rome still loomed large in the imagination of the world. The rock on which the church was established the throne from which there was no appeal, and the hand that held the keys. We have now, however, to chronicle the part, the large part, that was played by London in this great century of revolution. Henry Tudor rode to London immediately after his victory. At Shoreditch, he was received by the mayor, sheriffs, and aldermen, clothed in violet and bearing a gift of a thousand marks. He then went on to St. Paul's, where he there deposited three standards. On one was the image of St. George. On another, a red, fiery dragon beaten upon white and green sarsenet. On the third was painted a dun cow upon yellow tartern. Henry's coronation was celebrated on the 13th of October. His predecessor, Richard III, had disguised the weakness of his title by the splendor of his coronation. Henry Tudor, on the other hand, made but a mean display, perhaps to show that he was not dependent on show or magnificence. Stanley perceives in this absence of ostentation a kind of acknowledgment that Tudor's title to the crown rested more upon his victory than his descent. This opinion seems to me wholly fanciful. Henry would never at any moment acknowledge that his title was weak. On the other hand, he stoutly claimed through his mother to be the nearest heir in the Lancastrian line. His known dislike to ostentation is quite a sufficient reason to account for the comparative poverty of the coronation show, at which, however, one new feature was introduced, namely the bodyguard of the king's person, known as the yeoman of the guard. The king's belief in the strength of his own title was shown in his treatment of the lady Elizabeth. He had solemnly promised to marry her. He did so in January 1486, five months after his victory. But he was extremely loath to crown her, lest some should say that the queen was queen by right, and not merely the queen consort. The coronation of the queen was postponed for two years. The celebration, however, when it did take place, was accompanied by a great deal of splendor. Now, the business of Lambert Simnel shows the real peril of the king's position. The experience of the last 40 years had taught people a most dangerous habit. They were ready to fly to arms on the smallest provocation. Who was Henry, this unknown Welshman, as Richard III called him? 
that he should be allowed to sit in peace upon a throne from which three occupants had been dragged down, two by murder and one by battle. But the occasion of the rising was ridiculous. Edward Plantagenet, the young Earl of Warwick, was in the tower. It was possible to see him. Henry Tudor, in fact, made him ride through the city for all the world to see. Yet the followers of Lambert Simnel proclaimed that he was Edward Plantagenet, Earl of Warwick. Lambert's father was, in fact, a joiner of Oxford. Sir Richard Simon, a priest, was his tutor. The boy who in 1486 was about 11 years of age was handsome in appearance and of naturally good manners. After the defeat of his cause, Lambert and the priest who had done the mischief were taken. The priest was consigned to an ecclesiastical prison for the rest of his natural life. The boy was pardoned. They could not execute a child, but he was contemptuously thrust into the king's kitchen as a little scullion. He afterwards rose to be one of the king's falconers, the only example in history of a pretender turning out to be an honest man in the end. Can we not see the people about the court gazing curiously upon the handsome scullion in his white jacket, white cap, and white shoes, going to and fro upon his duties, washing pans with zeal, and scraping trenchers? The boy had a lovely face and manners far beyond his station. Can we not hear them whispering at court that this young man had once been as good as king, and he knew what it was to exercise royal authority? The real Earl of Warwick was still, however, allowed to live. With one pretender removed, another arose. Perkin Warbeck professed, as we know, to be the younger son of Edward IV, namely Richard, Duke of York who it was pretended had escaped from the tower. The strange adventures of Perkin are told in every history of England. He is connected with that of London on three occasions. The first was after his abortive attempt to land in Kent. The Kentish men, refusing to join him, attacked his followers, drove some of them back to their ships, and took prisoners, 160 men, with four captains. Those prisoners were all brought to London, roped together, a curious sight to see. They were all hanged, every one, some on the seashore where their bodies might warn other foreigners not to come filibustering into England, and the rest at Tyburn. The Cornish Rebellion was also an episode in the history of Perkin Warbeck. The men of Cornwall refused to pay taxes and resolved to march upon London. Led by Lord Audley, they advanced through Salisbury and Winchester into Kent. There they were opposed and moved towards London, finally lying at Blackheath. The battle that followed was chiefly fought at the bridge at Deptford Strand. Two thousand of the rebels were killed, fifteen hundred were taken, and Lord Audley was beheaded. Two demagogues who had instigated the rising, namely Flamach, an attorney, and Joseph, a farrier, were hanged. The rest were not pursued or punished. The city of London, in the meantime, showed its loyalty by a loan of four thousand pounds to the king and by putting London into a state of defense. Six aldermen and a number of representatives from the livery companies attended to the city ordinance. Houses built close to the wall were taken down, and the mayor was allowed an additional twelve men and the sheriffs forty sergeants and forty valets to keep the peace. The next episode in Perkins' career, which touches London, is that ride which he undertook very much against his will from Westminster to the Tower. Everybody knows how he gave himself up to the prior of Sheen. The king granted him his life, but he imposed certain conditions. He was placed in the stocks opposite the entrance to Westminster Hall, where he sat the whole day, receiving innumerable reproaches, mocks, and scornings. The day after, he was carried through London on horseback in sham triumph. They were ingenious in those days in their method of putting offenders to open shame. 
No doubt, Perkin was handsomely attired in colored paper with a tinsel crown upon his head. No doubt, too, he bestrode a villainous hack, while all the prentices of London ran after him, laughing and mocking. They placed him on a scaffold and kept him there all day long. In the course of the day, he read aloud his own confession, which is a very curious document. Quote, First, it is to be known that I was born in the town of Tournay in Flanders, and my father's name is John Osbeck, which said John Osbeck was controller of the said town of Tournay, and my mother's name is Catherine de Faro. Against my will, they made me to learn English and taught me what I should do or say. And after this, they called me Duke of York. And within short time after, the French king sent an ambassador into Ireland to advertise me to come to France. And thence I went into France, and from thence into Flanders, and from Flanders into Ireland, and from Ireland into Scotland, and so into England. End quote. The last occasion of Perkins' public appearance was on the day when he was hanged. After his two days' enjoyment of pillory, he was taken to the tower and was contemptuously told that he would have to end his days there in confinement. Here, he soon brought an end upon himself. He found in the tower the young Earl of Warwick, who, as we have seen, was a very simple young man. Perhaps Perkin understood very well that even if his own pretensions were hopelessly discredited, with the real Earl of Warwick, Clarence's undoubted son, grandson of the great Earl, the last male representative of the House of York, there would be a chance of a far greater rising than either Simnel's or his own. Perkin was already sick of prison. The chances of a rising seemed worth taking with all its perils and dangers. He was probably desperate and reckless. He accordingly bribed his keepers with promises to connive at the escape of the Earl and himself. One has an instinctive feeling that they only pretended to connive, that the course of the plot was daily communicated to the governor of the tower and by him to the king that the wretched man was encouraged and urged on in order to give an opening for the greatly desired destruction of the earl as well as his own. However that may be, in the end, Perkin and a fellow conspirator, one John Atwater, were placed on hurdles and drawn to Tyburn, where they received the attentions reserved for traitors. Perkin died, it is said, confessing his guilt. Guilty or not guilty, it was a convenient way of ridding the king not only of an impudent pretender, but also of a dangerous rival. Edward Plantagenet, Earl of Warwick, was beheaded on Tower Hill. His end is said to have been suggested by Ferdinand, the King of Spain, before the betrothal of Prince Arthur to Catherine of Aragon. It was 16 years after his accession that Henry Tudor caused the unlucky youth to be beheaded and now no rival was left to disturb the security of Henry's crown. There was, however, still a third personation passed over by most historians, this time by a native of London. The new pretender was named Ralph Wilford, the son of a shoemaker. He fell into the hands of a scoundrel named Patrick, an Augustine friar, who taught him what to say and how to say it. The two began to go about the country in Kent and to whisper among the simple country folk the same story that Lambert Simnel had told. This lad was none other than the Earl of Warwick. When the friar found that the thing was receiving here and there a little credence, he began to back up the boy and even went into the pulpit and preached on the subject. But this time the matter was not allowed to get ahead. There was no rebellion. Both the rebels were arrested. Ralph Wilford was hanged at St. Thomas Waterings, and the friar was put into prison for the rest of his natural life. In the year 1500 was a great death in London, and in other parts. The great death was due to an outbreak of plague, not the sweating sickness, which also returned later, but apparently some form of the old plague, the Black Death, 
It's one of the many visitations which fell upon the city, afflicted it for a time, filled the churchyards with dead bodies, then passed away and was forgotten. 20,000 persons, according to Fabian, were carried off in London alone. The king retired to Calais till the worst was over. On the 14th of November, 1501, Prince Arthur, then a little over 15 years of age, was married to Catherine of Aragon, who was then three years older. They were married in St. Paul's Cathedral. Hollinshed says that a long stage was erected six feet high, leading from the west doors to the choir, that at the end was raised a mount on which there was room for eight persons with steps to go up and down, and that on this platform stood the king and queen and the bridegroom. And on it also, the mayor and aldermen were allowed a place. This concludes part one of London in the time of the Tudors, Henry VII. We are pausing this story at November 1501 with the marriage of Arthur to Catherine. With only eight and a half years left to live, Henry VII's impact on London continued. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudors Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 